So, we're going to, into the 18th century now. Asylums were pretty grim places then. And indeed, before uh, all the sed sedative drugs that we have today, um, much like going to the zoo, you could pay to, to go and uh, view the insane for, for your amusement. Um, here's William Norris. And um, he was found in, an, in a cellar at the uh, Bedlam Asylum, having been uh, chained in uh, this position for over 10 years. And he, this is the actual picture that uh, appeared in some of the newspapers. And um, his case was one that helped people think about the insane and the way that they were treated um, and begin to think that they should be treated a lot better. So here is um, a report that was produced at the end of the uh, 18th uh, century about La Sepetria Asylum in Paris. And it says, uh, what made the cells more miserable and often fatal was that in winter when the waters of the Seine rose, those cellars situated at the level of the sewers became not only unhealthy, but worse still, a refuge for a swarm of huge rats which during the night attacked the unfortunates confined there and bit them wherever they could reach them. Mad women have been found with their feet, hands and faces torn by bites, which were often dangerous and for which several have died. So here's a picture of a Pinel at the end of the 18th century, um, releasing the insane from their shackles. And as you can see, um, there's a, a woman standing to his side, so grateful that she's on her knees kissing his hand in gratitude. Um, this is one of um, a collection of artworks made by insane patients at the Crichton Royal Hospital. Uh, throughout the 19th century, um, um, many people did have the opportunity to make art in hospitals, and particularly the private patients, because there was a class system. Um, so that if you had a bit of money, you were much, likely, much more likely to get a, a better time in hospital. But uh, many enlightened psychiatrists thought that making artwork was, was calming. So it's the precursor of occupational therapy. Um, it and, and acted as an amelioration to other forms of treatment. So as early as um, 1847, I found hospital records which um, uh, say uh, that... Um, Art was prescribed as medicine to patients and found to be curative. So uh, this is Sigmund Freud looking at a piece of sculpture. And the psychoanalysts at the uh, beginning of the 20th century believed that the symbols that occur in artworks are the, are the result of um, ideas and their unconscious ideas which are unpalatable. So they are the kind of ideas that we feel uncomfortable about having. And these are repressed. So these ideas are springing from consciousness and being repressed by our, um, our higher self and being squeezed in the process and then they become distorted. So this is the idea of the psychoanalytic theory of symbolism. And this led to psychiatrists looking at, art, looking at artworks and trying to decipher their true meaning. So just to give you one example, because there are lots of uh, examples of this. This is a, a picture, as you can see, it's a house uh, with a balcony and a, a woman running or walking on the balcony and a tree in the foreground. And this is the interpretation, and some of these interpretations are quite funny that the uh, analysts made of this particular piece. The unconscious fantasy picture depicts the artist as a child. The house is a symbol of the mother, he has stolen the ball, a breast symbol, and the father tree is after him to furnish, punish him for the theft. The branch projecting from the tree in the direction of the ball is the father's hand stretching forward to feel the breast ball to see if he, the child, has damaged it. So these are the surrealists. Now, the surrealists um, had the idea that art could be freed from... Uh, the shackles of logic and reason, and wanted to produce works that were spontaneous and exciting, uh, based on the ideas of free association. 
so, so because we're used to seeing animated work and, um, uh, uh, and so forth today, it's hard for us to imagine how exciting these works were when they were first produced. And the International Surrealist Exhibition in London actually stopped the traffic in central London because it was so, it was so popular. And this is a series of artworks to remind me to say that um, mainstream psychiatry also became interested in um, the artistic, artistic expression and um, during this period. So this is a, a, a series by someone who was a specialist cat painter, showing a psychotic degeneration of form. Um, this is Marion Milner, an analyst who started using images as an analytic aid in treatment in the 1940s. And very important are Gilbert and Irene Champenau, who set up an arts-based therapeutic community uh, following the bombings of Exeter in um, May uh, 1942. And her therapeutic practice was um, destroyed, and very bravely, uh, she and her husband decided to open their own home to their patients so that the work of healing could go on. So, and that's one of the therapists sitting in the garden sketching. And in fact, um, she arrived at Withermead as a patient and became a therapist because at Withermead, everybody, the staff and the patients, underwent uh, an analysis and they made art. And so it was possible to arrive in a state of distress to, un to make art um, and then to become a member of staff and to, to uh, carry on with the work. Um, and the, unlike the Freudians, they didn't believe that interpretation of the artworks was necessary. Um, they believed in the idea of art as therapy, that it was possible to make artworks, um, that it was possible to assimilate what you needed from the artwork, but just by, uh, even unconsciously, and that you, you therefore, the, the act of doing it would be intrinsically therapeutic. The uh, therapists were a little bit like the best kind of midwife. They'd be a supportive and um, friendly and create a space where the person could express themselves, but they wouldn't be interfering. So that was the philosophy within the studios. They also had clay, which they thought often was useful for people with psychotic episodes because it was calming and um, therefore more containing than using artwork. Um, this is the art studio. And again, that's actually a publicity shot that they did. That's the staff posing in, in that particular shot. So that's a piece from uh, Irene. As you can see, these are very expressive and flowing sorts of work. Um, this is a, um, a, a slide um, of Adrian Hill's work. And he started making art whilst he was a tuberculosis patient himself. I had, he'd served in the forces, a number of uh, military personnel contracted to tuberculosis and had a lo you know, long periods in the hospital. And um, yeah, he's, he was the worst kind of patient, you could imagine, in a way, because he not only started making art in, in the hospital, but getting all his fellow patients around him making art too. You can imagine he, he might have been regarded as a bit of a nuisance. So he'll argue that art therapy could alleviate the essential causes of despondency. But he, he, um, he, um, he got people to make artworks and talk about them. And some of the people that he would have been working with would probably be diagnosed today as having um, you know, post-traumatic stress disorder. But the concept didn't really exist then. But he, he had a holistic uh, uh, idea about art therapy. So that's an example of an exhibition. And he'd um, put on competitions for people. Uh, and they'd make artwork, and there'd always be some kind of cash prize to motivate them. And this is a lovely leaflet produced by the National Association for the Prevention of Tuberculosis in 1946, uh, Art Therapy and How It Works. And as you can see, there's a, a man there making art, probably in his dressing gown. He's recuperating in the sanatoria. So he'll believe that art therapy can get to places in the human organism beyond the reach of medicines, beyond x-rays. I like that, that's in the leaflet. This is Rita Simon, another art therapy pioneer at the 
Kingsway Psychiatric Club in 1944. And, as you, and she's, she's to the uh, right of the picture uh, dancing with one of the patients. And again, there was a real um, effort to try and break down the boundaries between staff and psychiatric patients. So um, in these kinds of environments, everyone would eat together, they'd recreate together um, to try and break down that division. This is Edward Adamson, uh, who had the first civilian art therapy appointment at Netherm. And he felt that Netherm was a very clinical and um, lobotomies were very popular at that time. So he describes the hospital, you know, with lots of people swathed in bandages and uh, also many locked wards. So it feels like a, very much like a prison from his description of it. And he um, established a, a studio there um, which he regarded as a, a sort of haven, a retreat from the rest of the grim environment. And uh, he, he was away from the rest of the hospital. That was very important for him. And he, he used to say that, well, even if they didn't make art when they came, they'd find the walk through the grounds therapeutic. So this was a, a place for people to escape to. Um, within the hospital, and uh, he worked with donkeys who sort of straddled them with a, your own little space to make art. Um, but probably Ed Edward Adamson is most famous for his psychiatric, psychiatric collection of uh, artworks. It's the largest uh, collection in Britain, and it's now housed at the Wellcome Trust. So that's a, a cry of the heart from one of the patients. And this piece, as you can see, is actually been um, done on a t two pieces of toilet paper. So a fairly crude piece of work. But others, as you can see, are immensely technically accomplished. This is Mary Bishop being demonstrated to a, a group of psychiatrists. And, um, they're, they're not looking too friendly, and she's completely naked. And interestingly, it's very similar to this famous piece of uh, Charcot, the uh, famous psychiatrist at La Sapetria Asylum, demonstrating a hysteric, because that's how they used to do the training then, that the psychiatrists would sit and then they'd bring out, uh, bring out a, a mad person to demonstrate. And uh, it, I, I don't know if Mary Bishop was familiar with this picture, but I thought it was an interesting comparison. And it, it may just be how psychiatry can make people, women feel, actually, uh, because they were still doing those kinds of demonstrations uh, in the 20th century. This is another example from the collection. They're very technically accomplished pieces of art. And thank you very much for listening.